Okay, uh, my name is Tom Cito, and uh, we're here on uh, June 17th, 19, uh, Year of Our Lord, 1998, <laughs> and uh, in beautiful Orange County to uh, do an interview with Mr. Chuck Jones. Hi, Chuck. Hello. How are you Good doing? to see you, Larry. All right. <laughs> they make animators bigger than they All right, so, okay, we're going to start with um, just talk a little bit about your childhood growing up and, uh, you know. Are, are you on camera now? We, we are rolling. Okay. We are on. This is not my, where I really belong. I, I, I belong behind the camera. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They want you to start with your full name. What's that? They want you to start with your full name and date of birth. My full name is Charles Martin Jones. I'm, I'm a half a junior because my father's middle name was not Martin. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You're named after your father. Yeah. My father was a kind of a dog anyway, so probably just as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was born in Spokane, Washington in 1912. Uh, the, I, I wanted to be born in Spokane because there was somebody there who was, uh, was well known. Bing Crosby is the only other person who was ever born in Spokane. Mm. But 1912 was an interesting year because that was the year that the, uh, the great ship went down, the Titanic mm -hmm. went down then. New Mexico became a state the same year. Mm -hmm. uh, but while other people were bemoaning the loss of life to the, to the Titanic, I was doing something about it. I was getting born to that. replace the one people that died. You see. I've been a very thoughtful person all my life. And I want you to know that at the outset. <laughs> <laughs> so did, did you grow up in Spokane? No, I didn't. I, I, I left there at a very early age of six months. Oh. My father contended I was the youngest child to ever be run out of town on rail. <laughs> So anyway, so anyway, now we came to Southern California uh, and grew up around here to the extent that I grew up, mm -hmm. and lived in uh, various places in Southern California. A good part of it at the beach at Santa Monica and Ocean Park, and then a, uh, the most part that I I revere most, and I think is probably the most interesting for anybody that's in the, in the films, is that we had a we had an orchard across from Hollywood High School on Sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. My father raised oranges and lemons. He didn't see any future in films. And uh, so, you know, it's funny about that. Uh, we had a tennis court and, and a big, you know, we had that whole block there. Uh, uh, and it's strange because it never occurred to me that any little boy in the world couldn't go out and sit down on his front porch and watch Mary Pickford ride by on a white horse as, as the uh, honorary colonel of the 160th Infantry of the Rainbow Division. That was 1918. I was six years old. But it's funny. When you're children, you don't, you, th you think everybody has that or that. I didn't know it was even an advantage. I figured any little boy could walk out and see her. <laughs> so we had, the, we had a lot of early identification with films, although father, father, and to the extent that he was in films at all, was, was an observer more than anything else. But we were two blocks from the Chaplin studio, so I, I used to go down there and watch him we used to, because there was a fence around, there were silent pictures, of course, and uh, nobody could... Um, Anybody could go and look, look and watch him work. But what got me was why he, why he, he did it over and over again, you know. Because I'd seen his pictures, and he did it right the first time, these pictures. <laughs> I'd see him in there doing 20. My father came home one day, and he said he'd seen him, seen him do one shot that ran 15 seconds, and he'd shot it 132 times of Chaplin. He was doing one of those things where, he, you know, the wonderful little things that they did where they, they come to a dead stop, and then they go around a corner with one leg in the air, see in the Keystone Cops. They all had that thing. Yeah. And they said they were trying for a winter scene because there's no winter available. So, so he wanted an icy sidewalk going around there. So he took oil paper and or oil cloth and then put a grease on it so that when he came around the corner, he would skid. So he skidded all right, but he, but he never could get his, his balance. It's 132 times. That always stuck with him, you know, and I realized that, boy, you've got to have that kind of care. And I suppose then I, I indoctrinated into my psyche was there was a was this feeling that the the one frame of motion picture stock is the tool that we work with. I, I know I didn't think about the time, but in looking back on it, I realized that, that Chaplin had this feeling that one frame would make the difference in whether it worked or not. One twenty-fourth of a second. When you get into animation, why well, you better know that. That's the basic tool. That's the the dotted seventh or the eighth note to a musician. That one frame. At, at, at what time did you decide that you wanted to be an animator? 
Well, I never decided I wanted to be an artist. The difference was that, that we all drew, and all of us grew up to work in graphic work one way or the other, but the, basic, the thing that, uh, that gave us the advantage was that, for one thing, my father didn't care much what we did, and, and my mother did, and the difference was that they, neither one of them criticized what we did. We brought a, a, a drawing to father. Father would look at it, and you know, okay, it's a drawing. <laughs> and uh, but if it came to mother, instead of saying that it's wonderful, she kept away from either criticizing, over criticizing, or over praising. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the second one is the worst, because if every time you bring a drawing to your mother, and she's always oh, that wonderful, and puts it up on the refrigerator, hangs it up on the wall, you soon lose any respect for her, her and yourself. You know that every one of your drawings is not great. So by and by, you lose interest. It's like you lose interest if somebody says you're a great baseball player and, and when you get one hit out of four. Remember Ted, Ted Williams said that, uh, he said, in what other business is there in which you can make three mistakes out of four and be, and be called a hero? And he said, <laughs> if I was any good, I'd be hitting every time. Well, that's true. And when you start drawing, you, you don't expect to be treated with, you know, every, every drawing you make is good. Yet it's amazing how many people do. So you lose respect for them, and they lose respect for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now, uh, was it, uh, at a certain age, uh, was it, you entered Chouinard uh, Art Academy. Yeah, you'll have to speak a little more oh, briskly. Okay, at a certain age. I have what I call a Ronald Reagan ear. I don't oh, hear the you. questions I want to hear. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. <laughs> so, so was it uh, at a certain age you you uh, you entered Chouinard? To uh, you know, you know, learn how to be a um, you know a formal artist and all that. What did you make that decision yourself, or did your parents say you know no. you should go to Chennai? No, the decision was made for me. Uh, you're making a big jump here, of course, from yeah. Sunset Boulevard to my schooling, but yeah. I'll do the best I can. I I uh, went through the usual uh, gymnastic, uh, verbal gymnastics to find out how the heck I could I could get through school. I was that was I was cons that's what I was fighting for was. To Anyway, mm -hmm. I was not a brilliant student, mm -hmm. but uh, at that time they had a thing called the Terman Test, Stanford Aptitude Test. Yeah. And I was in the fourth grade at that time, and I'd done so much reading. That was the one thing. I think that served my purpose of becoming a, an, an animator and doing graphic work more than anything else, was that we were, our house was always loaded with books. And I could always find books to read, and I started reading very early. And the first book that I, I remember keenly reading and still think is a good book was uh, Uncle Wiggly. And I read that, I think, when I was four years old. And, and then I went through our library looking for another book, an uncle book. Because I figured that if Uncle Wiggly was good, any uncle book was good. And I came across Uncle Vanya, which as it turned out was not exactly, it was Dostoevsky or some of those guys, I don't know, one of the Russians. And I didn't get very far. I couldn't get through the first paragraph. You know, the going was tough. So I, I lost, uh, so, but I, my mother helped me to solve that problem by looking at things that, uh, like, oh, my mother was a great reader, and also she was a great doll maker. Mm -hmm. And when she died at uh, 90, 90 years old, about, I think, something in that area, she had two books on her desk, and she was making a doll, you know, these beautiful, wonderful dolls that she made. And one, one book was uh, Peter Rabbit, and the other one was uh, Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain. And it, but the breadth of that, it, and I always felt that way. It didn't matter. You go from Peter Rabbit to Thomas Mann, because be, be, but you have to make this demand: the book has to be well said. And and Peter Rabbit's a hell of a good book, and so was the other guy. And uh, so, but my my father uh, had a had a rule which seemed to work pretty well. He he said, never in the history of man has any anything intelligent ever been said at the breakfast table. So he, he denied us the right to speak. He said, bring a book, bring a magazine, or if you can't do anything else, read the, read the uh, cereal boxes. But you have to read. And he said, it's hard enough waking up and going off to work and, or getting up and going off to school without having that terrible thing of listening to having to listen to people talk. So that's where we all learned to read, was at the breakfast table. And uh, so I, uh, I've always read very heavily, and when these term and tests came along, well, they seemed to indicate that I was brighter than I was. So they moved me from the fourth grade to the seventh grade, which was terrifying. Not only because I was, uh, I didn't, uh, you know, I was, I was among adults to me, and, uh, and then, so I went into high school very young, and after two years in high school, it was sheer agony for me. I don't know how anybody ever gets through school. Father 
and mother decided that it would be better for me if I went to art school because I drew a lot and had read a lot and there's hard, terrible books that I got in high school with Hugh Wynn, Free Quaker and Son of the Middle Border and things like that. Terrible. I'd read better books and my father said the only way to tell the difference between a good book and a and between good writing and bad writing is to read it. You'll soon establish that difference. And the same thing's true of drawing, of course. I mean, you soon learn the difference because when practicing, you, you, you learn what, what works and what doesn't work. And your admiration for others contributes to your knowledge, or it isn't a good piece of drawing. At, th at that point in your life, like, um, uh, were you influenced by uh, you know, radio or films that you saw, or, you know, what kind of sticks out? In that, in that, you know, in your childhood of like, uh, like, what was the first animation you saw? Well, I, I can't remember the first animation that I saw, but I do know that that it didn't need to be anything because uh, a great cartoon was made. Uh, Windsor McKay's *The Thirty of the Dinosaur* and *The Sinking of the Lusitania* and that couple of things, beautiful animation. But then it was like coming up like this and then dropping back down again, to where they started all very primitively back to the stuff with, with like uh, Martin Jeff running or a mouse running and then sailing through the air. It was marvelous because we'd never seen anything move before, you know. Uh, and here, here and, and, and the movement was enough. It didn't have to do anything else. And after a while, the, the sophistication of the films advanced because the audience became sophisticated. And, that, and that's, was, that's all it ever does. We can say all we want to about doing daring things, but unless the audience is willing to, to go with you in terms of sophistication, or advancement, why there's no point you're doing it, because you'll be clumsy and the audience will respond by, by despising what you do. But anyway, getting back to the thing where I went to art school was that they, just, they took me out of high school and put me in Chouinard Art Institute, the only fine art school here. And of course, I had no idea I was going to be, um, what I was going to do um, or why I was going to art school, but it was something I liked to do, I enjoyed doing. And, but I was introduced to art school where everybody, would, these were people 20, 22, or 25 years old. Many of them graduated from college. <laughs> so here I was, you know, and I was about half their height. For one thing, and I looked at these guys, and I thought, I, I can't compete with these birds. <laughs> you know, I, by that time I decided I wanted to be an artist, but I didn't know how I'd ever make any money at it. And uh, so at the end of the first week, I went home, and God, I was, I was so desolate. You know, I, didn't, I couldn't go... I couldn't do anything in high school. I couldn't do. I was a, I was a failure at 15, and uh, at least I felt that was a very profound failure. Uh, not really profound enough. I was a kind of slid in the middle of failure, you know. Some of it's picturesque, some of just dull. I was one of the dull groups. So I, uh, my uncle, this great uncle that were that lived with us, and uh, occasionally uh, came up and he said. You looked, you looked awful. He said, you, well, what's the matter? He said, you look like something the dog had under the front porch. And I said, you know, that's what I felt like. And he said, well, what, what's the matter? And I said, well, you know, I already compete with these guys at the school. They draw like Leonardo da Vinci. And he said, you know, they're 20 years old. I'll never catch up with them. And he said, uh, you know, I, I guess not. He said, how about the, how about the teachers and so on? He said, oh, I said, they're wonderful. Uh, they're wonderful. One, one of them, of course, got up in front of the first class in life drawing, and he said, every one of you birds has 100,000 bad drawings in you. The sooner you get rid of them, the better it'll be for everybody. And not, not for us, for everybody, for the world, you know. Well, that stuck with me. But anyway, that came a little later. But then I said, and I was just, you know, I, I just felt I, it was the end of the world for me. I could draw a little bit, but I couldn't keep up with the big guys. So I suddenly blurted out, and I said, you, 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 you know, got my lower lip out as you do at that age. and says, you, you, you can't make a, a racehorse out of a pig. And my uncle looked at me very gently and he patted me on the knee and he said, no, but you can make a very fast pig. And, and you know, I realized that was really what it was all about. I could only be good as, as good as I could be. I mean, whatever my limits were, those things, would, would, it wasn't that I had to compete with these birds. And I learned the second thing that, that creative work is never competitive, no matter how much you may think, think so. Uh, in, in the world today of animation in this particular year, there are a bunch of people making features. They're trying to make better features than each other. But that isn't the point. The point is you're trying to make the best picture, not the best picture that was ever made or the best picture that somebody else has made. There's no competition possible. When we were making cartoons at Warner Brothers, uh, we didn't know what MGM was doing or Warner Brothers was doing. It takes a year to, to make a cartoon. 
And so we'd, we'd had to make them and, and uh, not hope they were better than somebody else, but hope they'd be marketable. And more about that later. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's, uh, <clears throat> so I went through art school and as it turned out, that was the best possible schooling I could have had. And today is the best possible schooling that anybody could have to go into animation. A, a good director doesn't look for somebody that can draw a Bugs Bunny. They don't want him to draw a Bugs Bunny. If he can draw the human figure, that's the things you have to be able to do, is to draw the human figure. Why? Because oh, Bugs Bunny has a, has a skeleton just like we do. It's a different one. It's a different structure. But he, he has three fingers. We have four. And he has a thumb. They have thumbs. But if you learn the human anatomy, you learn that, there, that every, every animal, that, 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 that every uh, one of the vertebrates that is animals that have backbones, which I didn't, <laughs> at least not what I've heard before the principal. Um, but, uh, but this thing called the rib cage, we have, we don't care how many ribs there are in there, all we have to know is that, that every animal that's a vertebrate has it, even snakes. A short one, but nevertheless is there. Uh, every one of them has a backbone. Sometimes the backbone goes a little too far and becomes a tail. We know that. We know that when a dog, when we're standing up, and, and uh, this part is on the ground, when a dog stands up, this is in the air and his knee is way up here. But he's walking on his tiptoes. But he has the same bone structure here, but it's like a lady wearing high heels. A dog's leg is very much like that. I don't think the ladies are like that, but I, so I withdraw it completely. The comparison is odious. So anyway, and the front leg's the same way. And, and, and every animal has a, has a vestigial thumb. Uh, even on a horse, you find a little, up here on a shank, there's a little round piece of, uh, of flesh. And that's, that's what's happened, the poor old thumb. And, but we're the only ones that have this remarkable tool, the most important tool that has built every skyscraper ever built, has made every statue ever built, has painted every painting ever built, ever painted, the ability to grasp. And that, some animals have it, but like a monkey, it's too far up here to get an opposable thing. Well, John, Don Graham used to teach us, this great, the greatest of all teachers for animators, at Chenard Art Institute and later at Cal Arts, they teach the same story. And, and, and that is, we, we have to realize that when you, when you put your hand down, this is one thing and this is the other. This is on the, if you put it on a box, they, this part is like this and the rest of it is like this, and, and you can grasp. But it's opposite, you see, and this is not, we don't, we don't draw a hand like that, it's parallel. It's like the thing with the hand hanging like this. The most comfortable position on any part of our body is when we have an, opposing the extensor muscle and the grasping muscles. And, and if, you, if you go halfway between that, you're at ease because one is trying to stretch it like this and the other one is trying to clutch. And in between there is the most comfortable thing in the world, your hand, your legs or anything. And when, you're, when you're sleeping, you don't want to sleep with your legs like that. You want it this way. Mm -hmm. Again, the same thing. One of them is trying to stretch out and the other one is trying to pull back. And that, that's why we, when we relax, everything does, works that way. And we learned those things in, in, in animation, I mean, in the studying so-called so fine art. But Chenard was primarily interested in what every artist from the very beginning of time is interested in, and that is to control the line, the single line. That's it. That's it. You go back to the stage to the great uh, cave paintings 100,000 years ago, those guys at Peshmer and in and, uh, and, and Spain, and, uh, uh, they went in there and they... they and they can draw a single line, tell the whole story. Animation is built on that principle. You can't have shaded lines. And, it, and it's ridiculous to do a lot of shading on it anyway because a straight line when it's handled beautifully. I think it was Kandinsky said in describing the line, he said, my little dot goes for a walk. <laughs> you take a lot and go like this and, and it turns a corner or does a thing like that. That means that every point on that line is of equal importance. So when you're drawing, you don't go fast from point to point. You, you, you think of it carefully, and when you make that turn, it's very thoughtful. So that's what, they, that, that's what the teachers taught us. They didn't know they were preparing us for animation, but that thoughtful line. I mean, think about it. Those guys back there t today, you, go, you can go to those caves, and uh, many people are not privileged to do so, and I certainly wasn't one of them. But you look there, and you see that, that you invent, for instance, an airbrush when you need it. You don't invent it and then find some use for it. And so when these guys invented the airbrush, what they did was put their hand up against the wall, fill their mouth full of red ochre, <sighs> like that, and they blow it, and then pull their hand away, and there's a perfect imprint of their hand up there. That's the first airbrush. And later they were able to do it in other ways, but during that time, 
is pretty darn good, but then those wonderful lines, beautiful lines, and and uh, they used to think that those, some of those animals that had like seven legs looked like they were thinking animation, but that goes over. I understand over in the ice ages and so on beyond. That, that the artist went down there successfully, and somebody would draw the animal, and then he'd draw the leg in one position. Maybe a hundred years later, somebody would come down and put another one. And so it may have been religious or something, but you don't know. But, then, but that wasn't done by one artist. It was done by maybe a thousand artists over a period of a thousand years or 10,000 years. Boy. Mm. Anyway, uh, so anyway, the, uh, from that point on, I, I never had to worry about, about competing. I mean, it bothered me if somebody made a better picture than I did, <laughs> which I knew was better. That's the horrible part. Not that somebody else says it's better, but you know. And you see some guy that can outdraw you as far as you were concerned. Well, it didn't help me any because I, I couldn't figure out how to draw better any more than I, when I worked with Tex Avery. You know, I was one of his animators. And when I became a director, it never occurred to me to try to imitate Tex because I couldn't understand how he did it in the first place. He was unique. He was, he was a unique person, and he pursued animation in a way that nobody else did. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, he wasn't interested in character. There was only one character that he made in the whole time that was the sustains, and that, of course, was little Droopy. And I'll, get, I'll tell anybody a secret about that. If you want to talk like Droopy, it's very simple, because the, the animator, the, I mean, the man that did the voice went like this, and he said, you know what? You know what? I'm the hero of this picture. <laughs> and that's the way you do it. And you, you, I defy anybody to hold yourself like this and, and, and talk, you know, and say, I, I do things like this to him all the way through the picture. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Keep your voice flat and level, and you become that. But Tex wasn't interested in that. What he was interested in was anything that could, that could express himself, not in explosive terms. People tried to imitate Tex Avery by making everything violent. But every one of pictures, his pictures started out smoothly and evenly. And then, it, but you knew, like watching a ammunition truck, you know, you knew there was going to be an explosion, but you didn't know when. So you followed through all the way through, and then at the end of that, why he would suddenly do exactly. You know, when, when that more magnificent piece of animation that was done by Preston Blair, that girl, that wasn't rotoscope. He, he studied that to make that girl the way she was. He was a brilliant animator. Worked for Tex, and he did that. And, and Tex said that when he felt and saw her going like that, what he tried to do was transpose the ex ecstasy of a boy first discovering sex into, into visual movement. And so he said, when, this, when, when the guy comes like this and his eyes pop out and they go over and look at the girl and come back and get in his eyes and so on, and he lights a cigarette and it comes back and it burns all the way up there and then burns through his head. And all, you know, God, it's marvelous. Yeah. But he could carry film thing. And you know, recently when they, when they did the mask, uh, after all, practically every gang in there was Ted X Avery. When his tongue came rolling out like this and then rolled back up again in the mask, Tex did that 30, 40, 50 years ago. It doesn't matter. They, they, all this is open. Everybody has the right to use any other artist. Uh, we all stand atop every other artist that ever lived. And so it's a, it's a marvelous. Uh, it's a, it, it, we, and we came in there, of course, eventually you'll want to know what happened. At, Schlesinger Studios and why it was su as successful as it is. Yeah, I figured let's let's get now just back on the on the timeline too. So so which we got you like in Chenard and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to rail reel you back in. So uh, what what you, at what point did you say you know gosh darn it I want to be a cartoonist or or I want to I, work I didn't in, want to I, I yeah. I've fallen uphill all my life. I mean, <laughs> and a matter of fact, I don't think, I think most people make make. Uh, uh, circumstances dictate your action. Mm -hmm. Anybody that, can, that is so bright enough to think that uh, if I go into animation, I can become a great animator. No. But most of the, what we were looking for was a way to make a living. And uh, I, I went into commercial art for a while, but I, I, I was terrible at that because I couldn't, uh, I, I, I couldn't letter. And without lettering, you can't, I make a letter, but not in a postcard, you know, like a postcard writer can do so beautifully. <coughs> um, so, uh, but a friend of mine, Fred Kopetz, we went to Disney. He went, well, he actually went with, with Al Byworks. Al Byworks had just broken away from Disney. He was the one that animated all the early and great films of, of Walt, because Walt wasn't an animator. He was a great story man. Yeah. He may have been the best story man that ever lived in the motion picture industry. That's what Chaplin said. So I'm perfectly willing to join him in that. He knew what the public wanted. 
or I mean, pardon me, he didn't, he, the public didn't want it, the public grabbed it to their throat when he did it. They brought it to their breast. But, but he didn't know what the public wanted. What he did know was what he, what he thought was wonderful. The public would think so too. Now that's, a, that's an art form beyond all art forms. And uh, so... And Irix was the, was the actual creator of Mickey Mouse. He was the animator. The animator of it, yeah. No, no, let's make the difference here. Because what, what Mickey Mouse did was Walt, mm -hmm. the man that put it to work, the actor, if you like, or the artist that put it into action, was, was, uh, he was the partner. They were a great team. And uh, so, so Ubby, uh, and by the way, his name was Ubby, Ubby. And if you want some fun sometimes, spell I works backwards. Uh, if you don't want to go through the trouble, it, it's screwy. Yeah. And uh, so uh, Pat Powers, who was the money behind uh, Disney at that time, uh, was convinced that that, uh, that Ub Iwerks was the, was, the, was the valuable person. And he wanted him to start his own studio. So he left Disney and went and started Flip the Frog, which is not exactly the one that rings down the history of the, the corridors of time as great animation. It was great animation, but it was not funny. And it wasn't well written, and uh, so um, at any rate, the, the only thing for me was that he hired Fred Kopetz, who had been a, at, at school with me. And Fred called one day and asked me if I'd like to come to work there. And I said yes, I would like to come to work there. And I think I was getting sixteen dollars a month as, as a commercial artist, as a you know just a beginner. But they were going to pay me eighteen dollars a week to work with Ub, which was a lot of money in those days. And um, so I went over there, and, and of course the first thing I did was uh, was wasn't create, very creative. In fact, in, in by today's standards, it was one of the dumbest things that could be done. I was a cell washer, and in those days, a cell each cell cost seven cents, and you used a couple thousand of them in a picture. And uh, we should we should probably explain what cells are since they're practically extinct. Oh, so the term so. cell comes from celluloid. <laughs> yeah. It's short for celluloid. Today they're not of course. Uh, they're not from celluloid anymore, they're, and uh, I, I never went into the intricacies of, of that kind of thing. All I know is that uh, that they were they cost seven cents, and when you made a picture, and you brought all the cells back and washed them, <laughs> and that was my first job. And my friends thought I worked in a prison, <laughs> cell washer, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, in fact, it's very funny because at that time there were animators, and the people who worked for them were assist were in betweeners. They no such thing as an assistant or clean up or any of that stuff. Yeah. There was an animator and he had an in-betweener and that was it. That was the team. And they, they did some great pictures uh, together. Anyway, uh, so one time, it was during the gangster area. So one time, uh, I thought there might be some in-betweeners around that were working. So he put an ad in the paper and said, uh, ask, he offered to give jobs to in-betweeners. <clears throat> so one day the phone rang and he lifted up. My wife happened to be a secretary and she lifted up the thing. I says, I understand you're looking for a go-between. <laughs> a gangster area, you know, kidnapping was prevalent then, a good way of making a living. Uh, <laughs> so they said. <laughs> so it, it was just, it was kind of strange in, in that, but. Yeah, what was the, uh, was it the, the uh, oh, we got about a minute at any, um, I always heard that Iwerks was one of the fastest animators, like he himself, like he and Mesmer were like two of the fastest animators. I saw yeah. him one time, uh, I, I was sitting just three streets away, but he didn't use in-betweeners very much. Uh, but he could do 100 drawings a day, easy. Wow. And, uh, and he, like some, there were a lot of animators who were very fast. Ken Harris, who did some of the greatest animation in my pictures, always uh, did ne never less than 30 feet a week. And, and, that, that, and don't kid yourself, that was tough animation. I mean, like the dance sequences in, in, in the bear picture and the, and the stuff in the What's Opera Doc and so on. Most of that was Ken Harris. And he was doing 35 feet a week then. And he had two assistants uh, in between, if you like. Oh, they were by then. They were called assistants. But, they, but no animator at that time had a cleanup then. I mean, Benny Washam's drawings were so clean. He did 20 feet a week and cleaned up all his drawings. And uh, so it was different, to be sure. But, uh, but there was a hustle to it, a feeling this is a new thing. And we were all jumping in to do with the best and have the most fun we could, yeah. and uh, brand new. Okay. I think we're at the end of the, are we at the end? And action. <laughs> well, the, um, the term Walt, of course, is, um, 
in in animation, uh, asking Walt who would be a very strange thing. It'd be like saying Jesus and saying Jesus who. I mean, he was that well. Uh, he was that important. He was animation. In fact, if you said to an outsider uh, that you were in motion and animation, when they'd say, "Oh, you work for Walt," and they were, they, they wouldn't have to put Disney on it. And Walt Lance was making Woody Woodpecker and some of the others. And it was the saddest thing in the world because poor Walt could never quite become the Walt. He was the, he was a second grade Walt, and that's kind of tough. There were no Chucks, which is just as well. But Walt was the um, was the figure. He was the one, and he came from Kansas City, where Chris Freeling and uh, other great animators came from, and uh, and Hugh Harmon and Rudolph Ising, who did the harmonizing pictures, and and uh, a Carl number Stoll of other uh, famous Stoll. Disney animators. And Carl Stalling come from there. And Carl Stalling came from there. In fact, if we get on the music side of it, why Carl? We remember that Carl got his, most of his uh, his training there in the playing the the, uh, the giant Wulitzer organ for uh, for the feature pictures. And he said that uh, many, this is this is interesting knowledge too that many people do not realize that all the silent pictures had a score written for them, particularly the important ones. And um, so Carl was given that score and he played it with it was time to went with the feature, and the cues or everything were in there that to play the music of that particular uh, episode. But he said sometimes the music didn't get there, so he was given one rehearsal. He'd watch the film and he'd make his own notes. And that's why he used so many of the William Tell Overture and the, and the Grand Canyon Suite and so on, because they're a beautiful strain, beautiful dreamer and that kind of thing, because it covered a lot. And, but he developed his incredible memory. And that was why he was so brilliant at it. He also invented what is called the tick track. And that's a metronome track that goes electrically. It meant that you could now time an entire picture to the, to the tick. If you wanted a fast thing like uh, two beats to the second or three beats to the second or whatever it was, well, you, could, you could make out your entire picture without hearing the music. The music was written and the music would be done afterward so that everybody in the orchestra had, had uh, earphones on and he, and he would set the key and they would play the music. That, that really was a wonderful thing. So he invented the electric uh, metronome, you might call it. But um, Walt, of course, made Steamboat Willie, and uh, that, that was a very, very big picture, and it was the first one, of course, to be the sound. And later on, he did what, to me, one of the greatest of them all was, uh, was the band concert, one of the most remarkable and funniest things ever done. When Donald Duck appeared there for the first time, I believe. Uh, anyway, so Pat Powers persuaded uh, uh, Iwerks to start his own studio, which meant it was like starting a, a, a motion picture studio without a writer. And so this man could animate beautifully, but he didn't have the story sense. And he couldn't find anybody uh, to, to uh, substitute for war. So uh, that's when, the, so I went to work there anyway, and I, I, I was a cell washer and then, and then I became a painter. And that's the person that puts the, uh, puts the colors today, put, in those days it was black and white, so different colors of gray and stuff, and put on the back side of the cell, and on the front side, uh, eventually I became an inker, and they're the people that do the drawings on the front. They just put it down, over, this is not over a board, it's just you put down the drawing and then put a piece of celluloid over it, and then you just copy it. And, uh, and they you know, turn it over and put the, the colors on the, on the obverse side. That's generally what animation is all about, and then you put it under a camera, with a background and, and shoot it over and over again, 24 frames to the second. And that's really what all animation is. But you might say that animation is alive when you are able to flip it. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff is being brought into the audience. But an, an animator sitting here and flipping it, and you can learn to flip it so that it's the same speed as the camera, 24 frames. And when you've got two or 300 drawings in there, and you hold them up and flip them, you can tell whether the animation is working or not. In those days, they didn't have test cameras, and, and so you could you had to learn pretty well what your timing was, and uh, a remarkable craft. Like like uh, Adam Warner Brothers, we had to learn to time the entire film on music bar sheets before you ever went to the animator. And uh, there's a big there's a lot of stories about that. I don't know how far you want to go into this into this miserable area. 
Yeah. I think we'll just continue, you know, we'll just keep on the chronology. You know, uh, when, when was the Long Beach quake? Was it, were you at Iwerks when the, when the earthquake happened, the, uh, the big one? Oh, uh, well, no, uh, the, I wasn't there, but I, uh, I knew some animators that were. Yeah. No, I had, uh, about that time I got appendicitis, and uh, when I got well, I went down to Olvera Street and, and, and drew portraits for a dollar apiece and uh, grotesquely overcharged. And <laughs> uh, but I, I discovered one thing that that you could do is that, that if you're drawing a portrait of somebody, not a caricature, but if you're drawing a portrait of somebody, draw them in, in in profile because nobody knows what they look like in profile, and everybody's willing to do their, to believe that they're good looking. So I said they made a good looking profile <laughs> and did their hair nicely and all this stuff, and they were always willing to accept it. And a lot of them didn't feel they'd been overcharged by the dollar. I did discover, this is just auxiliary stuff, but it shows the kind of thing that artists have to put up with. Well, I was doing those in, you know, on Olvera Street, which was an old Mexican street that was revitalized, and uh, you could buy little pine nuts, like this, and, you, and you, in order to get into them, you had to crack them with your teeth. You also, uh, they had little pine tree-shaped uh, Mexican candies. They were like this, you know. So while I was doing this, I, I learned a distaste for the sound of cracking nuts and the crack, 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 crack. God, and here I'm trying to draw, you know. I'm an artist, right? Did any artist have to put up with this kind of nonsense? Did Da Vinci have to do it? Somebody sucking on us, so on. So anyway, uh, after a short time there, why Leon Schlesinger was opening up his studio, and uh, and uh, so I went out there and applied for a job and got it. Mm -hmm. And so I went for for 1930. Uh, 30, well, I was in animation in 31, then I went away for a short time. I came to to, uh, to uh, Warner Brothers, or Schlesinger Studio, actually, in 1933, in March 15th, 1933, a day that shall live in infamy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I stayed there for 30 years. Yeah. Now, wasn't it, uh, now, just before we start with Leon, uh, uh, didn't you have some sort of sojourn as a puppeteer? Yeah. Well, that was just passing. The, the Yale puppeteers were down there at that time, and uh, and uh, so I, uh, one time they, one, a reporter was coming in to take pictures of the Yale puppeteers, and they, they were either out uh, doing something else, so they made a picture of me holding up a puppet. I'd helped them a little bit, but nothing. So they made a picture of me, and I was supposed to be a puppeteer, but I was faking. I don't think I could have known what to, they called them manipulators, you know. Mm. But those guys were brilliant, and uh, there was one where, where, where the, the guy was playing the up above on the stage. There was a man playing a uh, an, an organ like like Carl Stallings. Well, rather than having strings coming down, they had wires coming up. So this guy had to lay down on his back underneath this organ with his wires and you know, on his fingers, you see, and then he could like this and so on. And the guy would then play down the God, but he couldn't even see. He had no idea. And, and but one thing that stuck with me always in in watching these men work, which could be a good stead later, is if you want a character in animation or as a puppet to be believable, you see that it's setting firmly on the ground. Now, if you if you ever had a puppet and you're young, you know, and you want to, you'll find that you can't, you don't have that sense of touching, so they'll be in the air most of the time, Un, not believable. And uh, these guys, these guys are so good that they could take a run somebody out, and the feeling was solid. They felt like they, their weight was, in animation, that's the first thing you try to learn, is how to keep a film, because there is no weight to a drawing. So what you have to do is to respond to that. I mean, if, if somebody is sitting on a chair and you want a feeling of weight, remember there's a fat surface, and this is, let's say you're going like this, and if you put it, the weight down, there'll be a bulge here. The animator should know that. So if Porky Pig sits down, there'll be a bulge here where he sits. And it'll be a straight line, because the, the more you put two fat areas together, the straighter becomes the line. So that if you have a, if you have somebody sitting on a bar stool, and why, if they're nice and fat and they got a lot of weight, why, I used to, we used to go in and sketch these people. They didn't know it in a bar because we could look out and here was a, was a bar stool and on it we could see the lady's bottom, you know, on there. And if it just went over on the, bounced over the side, she wasn't wearing a girdle, see. I mean, it came straight across here where the weight was coming, and there was some left over. But then, she, then the other lady might have a girdle on, and it would be straight, 
and crosshair straight in the curve here, but it had to go someplace so you, you could tell where, where it went because the vat was pushed up, and so you drew it straight up here and then around like this. I think um, the I think animation is is a, is a product of curiosity, and like w great uh, screen doctor Wilson Meisner said said uh, I, I respect religion, but it's it's doubt and curiosity that gets you an education, and that's certainly true. You know, I, I'm not satisfied with an animal moving a certain way unless I know that it has to move that way, and uh, watching a, a, a sloth, you know, moving, and you see that that it moves this way, and it moves slowly because it doesn't have to move fast. Nobody's going to climb up there and eat a sloth. Uh, they're, they're ugly and not very palatable. It's, it's interesting how uh, you talk about puppeteers and then thinking the computer artists, the digital artists of, of this day, 1998, the biggest problem they have with their images is weight. The, the film Godzilla's just come out, and you're looking at it and going, gee, he's not making good contact with the ground. Right. You know? and then it's, it's, you know, <coughs> if you don't feel that, if you want to see a very good example of that, and the brave little tailor that, that Disney did in the, in the short period when they, they, their great short subjects were done, uh, between 1933 30, and 37, when all the great animators went on to features. They said one of the reasons that animation short subjects came into their, uh, there was so much demand for them was <clears throat> that in, in 19, around 1930 or 31, the great Short subject man, Kipling, uh, pardon me, Kipling, he's a, he's a good man too. Um, but uh, um, all the great Disney animators uh, were kind of waiting in the wings while Keaton and Chaplin and uh, Harry Langdon and all these guys stopped making short subjects and began to make features. They needed the short subjects, but they couldn't get them from the live action, the great ones. So there were a lot of imitators, but they were terrible. So at that point, the gate opened and somebody realized these short subjects are valuable. We can make them and put them in the place of these guys. So during that time, some of our best cartoons were later, but the great Disney cartoons were from the 1930, I'd say 1932 or 1933 when The Three Little Pigs was done. The, the Three Little Pigs was, the, was the, the turning point in animation because for the first time, characters uh, were de determined by the way they moved rather than by what they, what they said. They move. Today, most of all, all Saturday morning stuff and a great deal of stuff on so-called children's, children's program called KidVid, which is one of the ugliest terms in the world and should be erased from, should not be allowed because it indicates that you're draw, writing down for children. And nobody has the right to write down to children. Don't, I better not get off on that subject. <clears throat> but it's, um, it was very, very important. And, and the three little pigs, you had three characters that looked alike but moved differently. They moved. They were simple terms, but they still moved differently. And uh, and so there, there you had it. And then suddenly I realized, and and everybody suddenly realized we had to make these characters come to life. Now then, all you had to do is go back and then find a, a dictionary written by a man named Noah Webster, who in about 1845, 1845, wrote under his name. Animation to invoke life. Now you can't say it any better than that. If it doesn't, and by that I mean, <clears throat> if you can't, if you can, can't tell what's happening by the way the character moves, you're not animating. It isn't what they say. That's why, much as I admire Matt Groening and, and people like that, that is not animation in the sense that we're talking about. When we ran our pictures, because because we weren't allowed to to to, to do them with dialogue. We always ran our pictures in the, in the, as test reels, that is, just the black and white, without backgrounds, without color, without music, without dialogue, to see whether it worked without any of those things. And if it did, then we were pretty sure it was going to work. I find today, when I travel on, a, on an aircraft, uh, that that's a pretty good way of judging a feature picture. I just don't put the things on. If, in the, if it can get my interest and, and it looks like a good picture by the way it, way it moves, then it may be worthwhile to put in those earphones on and listening to it. Usually it doesn't because I much would look out the window. So then they tell, say, put down all the things. And <laughs> I, I get over and look through the window. I, I mean, it's much more. Anyway. So let's, I think it's time for Leon. Time to talk about Schlesinger. Well, Leon Schlesinger was a, had been a soft shoe dancer and a number of other things, and he formed an outfit, which I guess is still in existence 
called Pacific Art and Title, and he made titles for motion pictures. And anyway, uh, he decided that he would finance a cartoon studio because he saw there was money there. He wasn't much of a, he, was, he wasn't exactly a, the most brilliant uh, or kindliest person, but he, he liked to make a Trump profit. So he, he formed a, a studio and uh, hired Hugh Harmon and Rudolph Ising. Now that's curious about those two guys because they worked together in Kansas City and uh, they apparently never realized when they put their two names together, Harmon and Ising, it'd be harmonizing. And uh, <laughs> that's funny, isn't it? So obvious. So uh, it seemed like a logical name to use on cartoons. So harmonizing um, and Leon Schlesinger got married and uh, they made Bosco and some other things. Good animation. That's when Fritz Freeling was one of their animators, and a number of guys were, and uh, names that wouldn't be particularly meaningful today. Ben Clopton would have been a cowboy, and uh, but he could draw, and other, a number of other people that were, came from different walks of life. Ken Harris, who worked for me, of course, he didn't work in harmonizing, but he worked for me, and he had been a, 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 a racetrack driver, and <laughs> he happened to draw, too. <laughs> And Ben Washam, who worked for me, was uh, was a partner with Bob Wyant when they when they they formed uh, um, the Bob's Big Bob's Boy. Big Boy. Yeah. And that first drawing was done by Benny Washam. Yeah. And 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 he hated it because years later Bob Wyant insisted that he uses the same drawing, but Benny said, "God, it's a terrible drawing, you know." And I've advanced a lot since then, and here this thing's facing me all over the country. So, uh, and that's funny. It's like as, as soon as you said that Benny, uh, you know, I, I knew that Benny at one point was the short order cook. When you'd see him, he'd always have that toothpick in the corner of his mouth, and he just and he kind of looked like a cook, you know, like he always looked like he was a wonderful cook. cook. Yeah. And yeah. even later, when uh, when he became an AA by, toward the end of his life, uh, he uh, oh he cooked magnificently, and he can he can make stews that you couldn't believe. He was also a good catcher on the baseball team at, at Hoover High School in, in Glendale. So are we wandering a bit? A little bit, yeah, yeah. So, so, so just kind of, so really like the, the, the famous characters like Bugs and Porky and Daffy, they're still a couple of years in the future now right, from 33. Well, yes. So. Uh, we had a terrible, they, they, they hired some, somebody once said that, uh, they hired a couple of uh, directors from Disney's and one of them was, uh, was so bad, somebody said failure went to his head. And <laughs> that's why he got a job with Leon. <laughs> and, uh, so he came over there as a director and, and, and invented a character that, of course, rings down the, the channels of time called Buddy. Buddy and Honey. Blah. So we, we worked on those characters, and they were terrible. And, uh, what, what but, at that, but you see, now, that, uh, at that time, Leon had divorced himself from harmonizing and decided, why should they share in my money? I will have to take it all myself. And uh, very natural. So uh, so he started his own studio again, and harmonizing went to MGM for a while and, and did, uh, uh, what was the name of the character? Uh, Bosco, was it? Um, was it Willie Whopper? No, that, no that, was, that was how I works. Um, anyway, if we're, if we're following this, this dubious thread through the intricacies of history, we'll find that, that about that time I, uh, when Leon made one of his most important moves, he made some terrible pictures, and then one day he hired Chris Freeling. He left to go more with that. And Chris was a brilliant animator, and he became a, one of the great directors, in my opinion, one of the great masters of timing. I learned more about his, and I worked for him as an animator, and I just was in awe of him. He never knew he drew well, but he drew beautifully, and uh, particularly for animation, because in animation, you don't have to do a finished drawing. What you want to get is the is the character. Like he would, he could could make a drawing of, of Sylvester, going like this, and, and the timing was perfect, you know. And it, it, the claw would come out and come down here, and it drop in about two frames, and then it would about come up in about eight. And it was perfect. You go like that, and uh, that was that was uh, Sylvester trying to scare somebody, and and he had a way with him, and and so. The way Leon should have learned, but didn't even realize what was happening, was that if you have a very talented person, it will attract other people who are talented, who want to work with him. To this day, most people don't seem to realize that. He had a great cornerstone. In the beginning of that, it was for his feeling. And then Leon, uh, uh, Tex Avery, who's been working at Universal uh, with Walt Lance, uh, 
came over to Leon and said he'd been directing films at, uh, at Universal. Well, Leon was too lazy to even call up and ask if he'd done it. He'd never directed a picture in his life. <laughs> you think that's the first thing you'd do is call up Walt Lance and say, you, you know, are you willing to let go of this director? Well, I guess Leon figured if he asked him why, why uh, they, they wouldn't let him, and then he would be able to hang on to it. Hang on to him. You know, he, he'd be willing to steal Tex, in other words. So Tex came over without ever having directed a picture, and Leon assigned Bob Clampett and me and Bo Cannon to go to work for him as animators. Now, there was no story department. We were the story department. I mean, we get an idea like Porky the Wrestler or something like that, and, or anything, the Wild West stuff. And we, we realized at the time, after a while, that Leon, that Leon had hired a corker in, in Tex. But we had a lot of fun. It was all one, you know. And we, in this place we worked in by the remarkable name of Termite Terrace, that's what we named, we gave it the name. It was an old bungalow that went to about, back to about 1915 in the middle of the old Warner lot on Sunset Boulevard. And it was called Termite Terrace. Well, and we had pet spiders, too, and things like that. It was so beat up, you couldn't believe it. And uh, we had a couple of mice and many uh, that lived there. And we, a couple of years later, when they built a new building for us, we, um, and we, we uh, took two or three spiders with us because we figured we wouldn't be at home in a new building without some, you know, some ingrown spiders. <laughs> Um, was, that, was Tashlin there by then? Yeah, Tashlin? Tashlin came later. Uh, as a matter of fact, I inherited Tashlin's. Uh, we were there for a few years, and were, uh, well, maybe two or three years, and then Bob Clavin became a director, and that was when uh, Bioworks went out of business, and Leon, Bob and I went out to, boy, this is really intricate, isn't it? Went out to Beverly Hills, where his place was, to rescue a couple pictures, and we directed a couple of pictures with him. And then Bob became a director, and then a couple about a year later, I think in 1937, I became a director, mm -hmm. not knowing how to direct, but I, <laughs> what the hell? Anyway, so I was fresh blood. Because we used to say, we know what to do with new blood, spill it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. so that's how I became a director. And, and um, but Tashlin had been working there. Tashlin was an interesting bird at first. He'd worked in New York for Terry Tunes, I believe it was. And one of those schools, and uh, no, he, Van Buren. Van Buren. Yeah, Van Buren. Yeah. And 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 he's the only man I've ever known that made a comic strip just to insult somebody, and so he made a, a comic strip called Van Boring, and he and he, he insulted Van Boring and every day in, the, in that comic, it was a comic box really, and um, he got a lot of satisfaction out of that. Nobody else ever understood that he was insulting him. Just one thing. Of course, I let me regress a bit though that. That William Randolph Hearst loved car cartoonists. He really loved them. He cared a lot about them. And the international studio that he founded in New York could have been the Disney studio. But these idiots they put in charge, and idiots, I mean, these stupid rats, they put in charge of the studio, decided that they would pad their payroll and stuff and take the money and put it in their pocket. And, and he was naive, as Bugs Bunny would say. He was naive and naive. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, and he didn't know until he found out that these guys had yeah. been cheating him. Around 1918. And he was 1918 or along in there. Anyway, that was too bad because here was a guy that really cared about uh, and, and cared about comic strip people and supported them. He was indeed the father of. Uh, of and he was a, he, in every other way he was probably a, a villain, but 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 every animator should look at him with 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 love because he cared about them. That old F. Opera, and a cartoonist that he had there that made a strip. Called, called um, Happy Hooligan. His guy it was a tramp that wore a, a, can, a bean can on his head. <clears throat> and as Opera got older, he became very infirm, and his drawings were terrible. But they, but, he, but Hearst realized that the only reason for this man's living was to see his stuff in print. So he printed him right after the day he died, even though it was. It was useless because there was no gags to it. There was any, his little groins were shaky and so on. But he could do it, you see. And people talked about him doing things like castles and so on. But think of doing that, of supporting a, a man in that one situation, which didn't hurt him any. But but it was but it was a thing that made all of us really care about him. So, so tell us about the the, the actual the, the shorts that you would do. Uh, you know, I always heard they had a real fast turnover for a six-minute cartoon. It was just like a couple of weeks. Or what was like the, the, the breakdown, like the schedule like? Well, well, 
but today, in, in, in uh, particularly in television animation, I suppose, uh, nearly all of us think, boy, you, you guys really had it easy. Because uh, each one of the directors, and then there were usually three, sometimes four directors, would direct ten pictures a year, and, uh, which is an hour. They were, they were six minutes long, and there was an hour long. Uh, so, uh, you know, that meant that every five weeks we put a new one to work. But we have five weeks on story, five weeks on direction, five weeks on, on animation with four or five animators, and so on, right down to the ink and paint division. And so there would be three units per doing the creative work, and then in the center of the building was the ink and paint division, and they'd work for everybody. And that meant they were turning out a picture every, uh, practically one every, every uh, two weeks. Mm. Anyway, so that's uh, so that's what. what excuse me. Uh, we thought we were put upon because at MGM, uh, Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera, who were doing Tom and Jerry, and that's all they did. By the way, there's a, there's a PBY if I've ever seen one. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. So, I think it's a flying boat, yeah. Yeah, it's a flying boat. Yeah. You don't yeah. see many of those anymore, yeah. do you? Yeah. Well, in case you're wondering what we're talking about, there's a big flying boat yeah. going back from the First World War, yeah. Second World War, pardon me. Mm. Anyway, um, I didn't mean to divert nope. anybody's attention, but they still have clippers in, in the editing rooms. That's right. right. They're picking up. <coughs> um, where were we? Oh yeah. Oh, we were talking about the 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 time it takes to produce a short. Oh yeah. Well, schedule. <coughs> yeah, the, here here's the 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 the, 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 the terrible. And looking back on it, at least anybody else in the studio, anybody else in in, in motion pictures and animation. And, and I know that that uh, that Martin Scorsese and, and I've talked to him about him and Steven Spielberg and and George Lucas have all astonished that you could do a picture, lay it out and time it to exactly six minutes, uh, and no editing. We have no editing to our pictures. Uh, you had to finish the story, and without showing it to anybody. I mean, sometimes we have a jam session, but. Uh, you time out the entire picture after the storyboard. The storyboards were not complete. They were just rough ideas of what would go in and be a bunch of gags. The director's job was to put those together into some kind of logic, and um, solid logic, really, and, um, and then to time the entire picture on, on music bar sheets or on exposure sheets. An exposure sheet is a sheet about this long, with, which would either be on that it's a line thing. Uh, and that would be... Uh, would be six feet or four seconds, and on that you'd have Bugs Bunny walking and show how, say, 12 frames. If he was strolling, it'd be 12 frames. If he was in a hurry, it'd be six frames for each step, and so on. We learned to time it. I think we get to the end of the cassette. 